Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mary Larson, and on behalf of the Center for Oklahoma Studies and the Edmund Lowe Library, I'd like to welcome you today to this virtual book talk uh, where we're highlighting the recently released and excellent volume, This Land is Her Land, Gendered Activism in Oklahoma from the 1870s to the 2010s. Uh, we're very fortunate to have that book's editors, Dr. Sarah Epler-Janda Epler and Patty Laughlin with us uh, along with, and, and that's doctors, Sarah Epler-Janda and Dr. Patty Laughlin uh, with us along with three of the contributing editors. And we're looking forward to their discussion of the book. Just to give you an idea of how the program will proceed, um, once I introduce Sarah and Patty, Sarah will provide an overview of the book followed by Patty's introduction of three of the chapter authors um, who will then talk uh, for 12 to 15 minutes each on their contributions. And we'll end the panel with a Q&A session. Um, chat will be disabled, but you can participate through Zoom's Q&A feature and we'll finish up by 4.30. Uh, before we get started, I also wanted to make you all aware that the session is being recorded for future viewing and you should have gotten that notification. So let me provide just a few words of introduction to the editors of This Land is Her Land. Uh, Sarah Epler-Janda is a professor of history at Cameron University, having earned her doctor doctorate in history at OU. Uh, like This Land is Her Land, a number of her previous books have focused on activism, including Beloved Women, The Political Lives of LaDonna Harris and Wilma Mankiller, and 2018's Prairie Power, Student Activism, Counterculture, and Backlash in Oklahoma, 1962 to 1972. Patricia Laughlin is a professor of history at the University of Central Oklahoma, who earned her doctorate from OSU. And like Sarah, many of the themes from This Land is Her Land appear in her previous publications as well. Um, her book, Hidden Treasures of the, the American West, Muriel H. Wright, Angie DeBoe, and Alice Marriott, uh, received awards from the Oklahoma Historical Society and the Oklahoma Center for the Book. And her book for younger readers, Angie DeBoe, Daughter of the Prairie, won an Oklahoma Book Award. Both editors have brought a wealth of scholarship and experience to their work with this book, and it shows um, at this point, I'm going to turn the floor over to Sarah, who is going to tell us a little more about This Land is Her Land's origins and developments. So, Sarah. Thank you, Mary, and thank you very much for the opportunity to share our work with you today. We very much appreciate that. And to the audience, you're in for a very special treat once Patty and I stop talking and you get to hear three of our fabulous writers for this project. Um, this really came about because Patty and I over the years have talked a lot about the lack of attention to women's history, particularly in Oklahoma. And we wanted to work on a project that allowed us to work with really great scholars in the field. And so we started talking about the project and decided it would be really cool if we could work some, with some great writers who were female and we could write about women and their activism in Oklahoma. And that's kind of the early stage of how this came together. So this is a project that involves 13 female scholars across different phases of their academic careers who focus on the activism and the work of 13 women. And the way that we conceived of the term activism is really just women that wanted to change the world around them. And as you will see from our three presenters today, each of the women that are discussed tried to affect change in the time and place in which she lived. And we use this idea of activism very broadly, but I think you'll, you'll get some wonderful insights into the work of, of the individual women that will be discussed today. The book itself covers a long period of time and is divided into three sections. And so the first section is on kind of this centered around this concept of the fluidity of power. And our first two chapters that will be discussed today really fall into that. And you get to see an example of an indigenous woman and a white woman who are both navigating these momentary opportunities to try and affect change. 
the third chapter that you'll hear about today really could have been partially in the fluidity of power, but also in our second section of the book. And it's the first um, chapter in the section of the book that we've entitled The Gendered Politics of Segregation, where you really see the, that even within the throes of the horrors of segregation, the experience of being female and being Black really characterized a lot of aspects of the experience that women had in Oklahoma um, in this time period. Our third section of the book reveals that despite some of the significant changes that had taken place, there are really these contested notions of what equality means. And so in our last section of the book, we have a range of chapters that deal with issues surrounding the Equal Rights Amendment, the indigenous efforts to restore sovereignty, the rise of conservative activism as just a couple of examples. And so what, what we hoped to do today is to give you some insights into the struggles that women go through to try and find opportunities to affect change improve their surroundings. The way that they identify improving surroundings doesn't always mesh with the way that um, others would think. These are not women that are necessarily liberal in their mindset or conservative. Uh, some are very much in one of those two, count, do, two camps. But what we invite you to do is listen to these authors and the work that they put into trying to articulate the lives of three significant but ultimately incredibly different women. And with that, I will turn it over to Patty for introductions. Thank you so much, Sarah. And welcome to all of you uh, audience members. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We're so excited that you're here with us today. And a special thank you to Dr. Mary Larson uh, and the Center for Oklahoma Studies at Oklahoma State University. Uh, it's uh, really special for us uh, when we think about this project uh, to acknowledge the team at the University of Oklahoma Press as well, including um, our original acquisitions editor, Kathleen Kelly, uh, in addition, Kent Calder, uh, Alessandra Jacoby, uh, Talumovich, and Stephen Baker. This team at the University of Oklahoma Press, and the book is very significant to us. Um, and to the press because it's the first book in the new series at the press, uh, Women and the American West series with series editor Renee Legrade. So uh, thanks again for this opportunity. In addition, it's such a joy for us to work on this project. I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to work with my colleague, Sarah Epler-Janda and our 11 amazing scholars. And today we feature three of them. Uh, Dr. Rowan Steinecker, Dr. Sunu Kodamthara, and Dr. Melissa Stuckey. And we begin today with our first speaker, Dr. Rowan Steinecker. Rowan Steinecker is a former National Academy of Education Spencer Institute postdoctoral fellow and assistant professor of history at Florida Gulf Coast University. Rowan received a PhD in history from the University of Oklahoma in 2016. Her areas of research and teaching include education history, the history of the American West, and public history. Rowan Steinecker is currently working on her first book manuscript entitled The Struggle for Schools, Education and Sovereignty in 19th Century Indian Territory. And Rowan is also leading a collaborative community-based history project in conjunction with Upper Captiva Island in Southwest Florida. Rowan. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate here today. And thank you, Patty, for that introduction. And thank you uh, to Mary for organizing this event. Um, I am going to quickly pull up, I have a PowerPoint. Um, it's pretty sparse with just some uh, quotes and images for you, but give me one moment here to pull that up. Um, right. Hopefully you can all see this. So what I plan to do today is 
really to spend a few minutes introducing you to uh, Lila Denton Lindsay, who is the focus of my chapter in this book. So Lila Denton Lindsay was a citizen of the Muscogee Creek Nation. She served as an educator and a civic reformer um, during the late 19th century and early 20th century. So that period spans um, this era in which we really see that fluidity of power that Sarah was just speaking to. So that's going to include, you know, um, allotment policy being implemented in the Muscogee Creek Nation, the territorial period, and then that transition into Oklahoma statehood. So I hope that an examination of her life helps shed some light on the significant role that indigenous women activists like Lila Denton Lindsay played in both the history of Indian territory and then the continuity of their work into um, the period of early Oklahoma statehood as well. Um, and also, uh, I think that her um, work also just speaks to the, the broader history of uh, the progressive era in the American West as well. So I'm going to just kind of give you some of the highlights here today. I know our time is brief. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of background on Lila Lindsay, um, walk through some of the key reform efforts that she was involved in and try to particularly highlight her ongoing commitment to supporting and advocating for um, both children and women at this time. So all of this is covered in much more detail in the book chapter. Uh, and I'll just give you know, the quick disclaimer that there was much more I wanted to include in the chapter as well. Uh, but of course there was only space for so much. But uh, if you're intrigued by what you hear, I definitely encourage you to learn more about her um, because she's very fascinating and she also wrote prolifically uh, about her own life as well. Um, and she's very, you know, witting and her writings really draw you in. So, um, you know, I encourage you to continue learning about her after today. So Lila Denton was born in 1860. Her father died during the Civil War. And when she was 12, she began attending the Tallahassee Manual Labor School, um, which was a prized academy in the Muscogee Creek Nation. And at the time it was under uh, the administration of the Creek National School System. It was also her mother's alma mater. Um, she was very passionate about learning and attending school. Uh, there she studied, you know, the classic subjects uh, we might expect at any academy in the American South at the time. So algebra, geometry, grammar, history, music, um, but she did have to leave in 1878 to help care for her mother who was in very ill health and then soon after died. But she consistently maintained what she called a quote, haunting desire um, to have a finished education. She even rejected a marriage proposal uh, as a young woman telling uh, the man that um, quote, I have no idea of marrying you or anyone else now. I'm planning to get a finished education. I'm not going to be derailed from my plan and I'm going off to the States to get an education and do missionary work among my people. Uh, and this goal that she states here to go attend, um, what her goal was, was to attend college and then return and serve her people. That is a, a consistent thread we see um, throughout here when she was a young woman. And she did receive that opportunity. So uh, at this time, um, the Muscogee Creek Nation subsidized a, a college scholarship program to send students um, off to universities in the United States with the hope that they would come back and apply their schooling to serve and defend their nation. And so that program aligned closely with uh, the aspirations of Lila Denton. And so she was lucky to receive a scholarship through this program called Youth in the States. And she attended Highland Institute in Ohio. Now, while she was there, uh, she became involved with temperance 
uh, activists in the region who were, um, you know, kind of coming together and fighting against liquor traffic um, and the distribution of alcohol. And she was also very involved there in Ohio in local aid organizations as well. In 1883, she became the first Muscogee Creek woman to earn a college degree. I love that she liked to joke that um, because so few women uh, received college degrees at the time, hers read mistress of liberal arts instead of the traditional bachelors. Um, but like I said, her intent all along had been to return home and serve as an educator. So after she graduated, she did just that. Uh, and that poor man you might have felt bad for a few minutes before who she rejected, uh, she did eventually agree to marry him. So that was a man named Lee Lindsay, uh, who'd been very patient. But even after she was married, she continued teaching. Um, and this remained her main vocation for about a, a decade. So she had um, you know, very well-known reputation as this college graduate, and she soon uh, established a reputation as a very successful instructor as well. And this provided her with a great deal of recognition and respect from students, uh, parents, and education officials in the Muscogee Creek Nation. Um, and so they had uh, an extensive public education program at the time um, with very high standards that included uh, an annual teacher's institute and examination, you'd have to earn a certificate. But I do love that she recorded one story in which she said she went to uh, and asked to be, sorry, asked to take the examination to get her certificate for that year. Uh, and the officials were afraid she would turn the tables on them and try to examine them instead. Uh, she was successful though in getting her certificate. But she suffered from continued ill health. And so in 1894, she decided to retire from teaching. Um, but she said that that always remained her first love, but her other greatest interest was to assist the poor and struggling people, especially women and children. So she built on her earlier work with temperance activists in Ohio and became involved with the Women's Christian Temperance Union or WCTU um, when it began to organize chapters in Indian territory in the 1880s and 1890s. And she also supported this organization's larger reform agenda, which included things like women's suffrage, labor reform, and uh, legal protections for women. So she played a leading role in um, some of this. She helped organize the local Tulsa WCTU chapter, and she later served as the president of the Indian Territory chapter. Um, I want to take just a step back here. Um, and you know, kind of remind us all that during this period, we are starting to see uh, the political landscape shift. And so during the course of um, Lila Lindsay's career here, we have the 1898 Curtis Act, which mandated land allotment for uh, the five tribes and the dissolution of their governments. That includes the Muscogee Creek Nation. And this was a unilateral legislation that catered to, uh, you know, the desires of white settlers who wanted to come and settle in Indian territory. And it annulled treaties with these native nations and undercut um, their ability to exercise their sovereignty. Uh, and then as we transition into Oklahoma statehood, uh, that subsequently solidified a power structure that really privileged the status of white males and marginalized and often violently oppressed people of color. And women held a very precarious position uh, in early Oklahoma society because they remain, remain largely disenfranchised. Um, but even in this climate, some of these civic reform efforts uh, allowed individual women, including indigenous women, as well as um, their collective power through some of these organizations to try to push for reform and make their voices heard in the public sphere. 
So it's really difficult to sum up the many ways that uh, Ludwig Lindsay contributed to all these various reform efforts, but I just wanted to provide a very quick list here of some of them. Um, there's much more even later in her career, but this should give you an idea of some of the various things that uh, she was involved with and in trying to achieve at the time. Um, so if you see here, she organized the Tulsa chapter of the Humane Society. She helped establish the Francis E. Willard home, which was a home uh, that served needy women and children. She helped create the Tulsa police matron position uh, after um, what was quite the struggle to lobby the city council there at the time. Um, and then once we get to the onset of the First World War, Lila Lindsay remains you know, very involved in trying to support the war effort as well. So she was an active member of the National Women's Relief Corps. She was appointed to serve on the Tulsa uh, County Council of Defense and helped found a women's division and played a large role in fundraising efforts and education efforts for that as well. Um, so in some respects, you know, her support of the U.S. war effort in the First World War may be surprising considering the very recent um, federal policies that targeted her nation. Um, but this is a pattern we see uh, during this time, and that was a, a very high level of involvement and contribution to the First World War on the home front on the part of Indigenous peoples as well as in military service as well. Um, so Lila had also been a longtime advocate for women's suffrage, including through her work with the WCTU. And in 1918, when Oklahoma ratified an amendment granting uh, women universal suffrage, suffrage, this marked a considerable victory. Uh, but she recognized that uh, just granting women's suffrage on paper didn't automatically guarantee, you know, full inclusion and participation of women in Oklahoma politics. So she was still very much a teacher at heart. She helped launch a campaign to educate women on their voting rights, um, organized um, meetings um, to do so. And then in 1924, she also compiled and published a book um, you can see the title here on the slide, a study in the course of citizenship on federal and Oklahoma laws pertaining to women and children. So again, that same um, sort of theme that we see throughout her lifetime here, uh, continuing on in this ongoing um, fight for suffrage and then uh, in the effort to exercise voting rights as well. So you can see this last line here on the slide. This, these are just a few more examples of some of the various women's organizations uh, that she was involved in here during this period. She played a leadership role in several of them. Um, and this wide ranging network of women's led organizations really helped serve as a powerful vehicle for trying a, to achieve um, you know, various ways to affect and change the society that she and other um, women and indigenous women uh, were living in here in early Oklahoma. Um, so this was just, I know this was very brief, but I hope you can see um, by touching on all these highlights that this report that was written, uh, summing up her career here, um, really strikes a chord. It says, with a real vision of high endeavor, she has worked unstintedly toward the development and achievement of almost every phase of activity to women, as well as to the community, whether it be educational, civic, legislative, political, cultural, or patriotic. Um, so her significant contributions to such a wide ranging number of reform efforts during this time really showcases the important role that Native women activists like her and her peers played first in shaping uh, society 
and culture in Indian territory. And that continued on into Oklahoma statehood, despite a number of structural barriers in place at the time. Um, so thank you so much for listening to me this afternoon. Uh, I know we have time for discussion afterwards, so I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have at that point. Thank you so much, Rowan. The topic is fascinating. I know we have lots of questions, so we would just encourage our, our audience members to hold those questions and be thinking about those questions for the discussion, but we really look forward to that the the, uh, the book project and uh, this is just a little um, uh, sketch of this larger work and so it's fascinating it's fascinating to us thank you thank you our second speaker today is Dr Sunu Kodumthara and Sunu Kodumthara is professor of history at Southwestern Oklahoma State University where she has taught since January of 2010. Sunu graduated with her PhD in American history from the University of Oklahoma in 2011 and is currently editing her manuscript titled Anti-Suffragists and the Dilemma of the American West. Sunu currently teaches courses uh, including survey, Oklahoma history, 20th Century America and Women in American History. Sunu Kodamthara has served on the boards for the Western Association of Women Historians, as well as the Coordinating Council of Women Historians. In addition, Sunu serves as a board member for Oklahoma Humanities. Sunu. Thanks, Patty. I want to thank uh, Mary Larson and Oklahoma State University for uh, hosting our panel. And of course, I want to thank uh, Patty Laughlin and Sarah Janda for uh, inviting me to contribute a chapter to this incredible volume and being a part of all of these uh, amazing, amazing uh, chapters. This is uh, such an honor to be a part of um, and such an important work. Um, and so uh, my uh, particular chapter is about a woman named Catherine Barnard. And um, if you're looking in the book, it's chapter four. Um, so I will be completely honest. I'm gonna present, um, begin my presentation with a confession. Um, so early on in uh, graduate school, you're taught um, to be open-minded. Uh, in your research and to be open to what the primary sources teach you and to make sure that you are um, ready to accept whatever the sources tell you. And um, when Patty and Sarah told me that um, they would like for me to write about uh, Kate Barnard, I was not open-minded, uh, primarily because I went in with um, the presumption that I already knew about her. And what I knew about her was that she was an anti-suffragist and that she was the first woman elected to office in Oklahoma. That was enough. Uh, and I was wrong, 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 wrong. So um, the problem had been that I had gone off of the conclusions that other scholars had made based on her career, based on the public statements that she had made, um, but these weren't actually statements that she had really made. And so what I realized was as I had examined her life, her career, um, and as I had looked over um, not just her own career, but the statements that others had made about her, what I understood and what I had learned again was that you cannot study things in a completely binary state, that just because she did not campaign for women's suffrage did not make her an anti-suffragist. And this was a very difficult lesson for me to learn because I had spent the previous 15 years of my career studying the anti-suffragists of the American West. And so I had assumed that I'd known everything. And so Kate Barnard threw me for an absolute loop. 
in, in my understanding of um, women's history and women's political history at large. Um, and so uh, what actually helped in um, not only learning this powerful lesson, but learning about her life was that the Oklahoma Historical Society had recently digitized her diary. And in reading this diary, which wasn't just a diary, it, it was an autobiography of sorts. It was um, this fascinating insight into what she thought about other people, other politicians, and her own personal beliefs about um, politics, about um, women and women's issues. And so I wanted to give you all um, a little bit of an overview of her life and um, some of the opinions that she had formed over the course of her career. So Barnard um, was born in Nebraska in 1875 and she had moved into Oklahoma with her father when she was 16. And her father had been involved in territorial politics and that was her first real um, experience with uh, politics. And she had earned her teacher certificate, um, taught in one room schoolhouses, but she didn't really like it. Um, and so she attended secretarial classes and worked for the Oklahoma Territorial Legislature. And that was when she had first experienced uh, politics for herself. Um, is territorial secretary, uh, secretary for the territorial legislature, uh, they appointed her as the quote unquote territorial hostess. Uh, and in doing so, they sent her to the St. Louis World Fair, World's Fair in 1904. Um, and at the World's Fair, she was able to meet with social scientists from uh, around the world and learned about modern ideas about how to fight poverty and how to deal with um, modern issues of the day, such as juvenile delinquency, uh, things that uh, progressives were addressing. And that's when she really sort of embraced her new political identity as a progressive woman. And this is sort of picking up where Rowan left off about that sort of progressive woman uh, in a progressive era, right? And sort of um, becoming a politically active woman in a time period where it was acceptable to be a politically active woman. Um, so by 1905, uh, Barnard um, not only embraces this new identity of political activism, uh, she then becomes president of uh, the Provident Association in Oklahoma City, and she is invited to talk about um, more charitable uh, works, uh, and in doing so, she starts writing articles uh, in the Daily Oklahoman, which by then, of course, is uh, the newspaper, uh, the primary newspaper in Oklahoma City. In her articles, she's not only writing about poverty in Oklahoma City, she is asking Oklahomans to do something about it. She is telling them about how it is their moral obligation to help people, to save people, about how it is their Christian responsibility uh, to, um, to save all of these people, to reach out to them. And she uses this relationship with the Daily Oklahoman and with uh, mass media in general uh, to develop a strong relationship that she will later then use to her political advantage. Um, and so this is all really sort of developing into something that she's going to use in terms of her career, right? Um, so when she talks about um, this relationship that she thinks is important between the moral leaders of Oklahoma City and the poor and impoverished of Oklahoma City. She's also uh, creating a relationship uh, with uh, between herself and the working class in general. And she decides to start to uh, she decides to expand this relationship by working more um, to 
get to know these people in a deeper way. So she doesn't just want to know about their living conditions, she wants to know more about their working conditions. So she starts to meet with minors, she starts to meet with working women, and she starts to get to know them in terms of their unions. She becomes uh, president of a working women's union. Uh, she starts to work with the miners union. Um, in fact, in January of 1892, there's a massive uh, mine explosion where nearly 100 miners uh, die. Um, hundreds of miners are injured. Um, and so she starts to fight for uh, better working conditions for the miners. Um, in working with these unions, these labor unions throughout Oklahoma, uh, she starts to work more closely with socialists, which also become a large uh, movement at the same time that the progressive movement develops in Oklahoma. You can learn more about this if you uh, read Jim Bissett's, uh, Bissett's um, excellent work um, Agrarian Socialism in America, uh, which was published by the University of Oklahoma Press, I think in, in either 1999 or 2000, I believe 1999. But he writes about uh, the movement that develops between Oklahoma farmers where they use uh, where they use a combination of Christianity and their own struggle as farmers to tie into socialism. And she uses the same argument. She says that uh, socialism becomes a great option for them to rely on. Um, she never identifies herself as a socialist. She is careful not to do so. However, she says, listen, these socialists might have something to their, something to their uh, party platform. She admires their party leaders. She described uh, Patrick Nagel, who uh, helped organize the Oklahoma Socialist Party as a statesman and one of their best legal minds. She admired Emma Goldman as uh, an independent thinker. She admired her for uh, not wanting to compromise her ideals of life. Um, so, these progressives, many progressives who identified themselves as suffragists, socialists who identified themselves as suffragists, um, there are several of them who don't understand why she doesn't identify herself as a suffragist, which is what I did not understand. Um, there is no indication that she didn't oppose the right to vote, right? She never came out and said, I oppose the right to vote. Instead, she would say things like uh, how she supported a woman's right to work outside of the home. In fact, she insisted that, a bef that before women uh, got married, that a woman should work in order to develop self-confidence, in order for her to understand uh, what it's like to depend on herself. Um, she insisted that if a woman remained single, like she did, that, she, that women should become leaders and women should have the opportunity to become leaders. Um, what she would say is that suffrage wasn't necessarily um, something that she needed. Um, she was a lot like Goldman in that sense. Emma Goldman argued that suffrage wasn't something that actually helped. Emma Goldman would argue that it was economic equality that was necessary and that suffrage wasn't actually helping the system. It was only adding to the burdens uh, that a woman would carry. And what Barnard would argue is that suffrage was not, was not necessary within this system because she was able to work within it and make, uh, make things possible for women as is. Uh, consider this. Kate Barnard was elected to office without the right to vote and with the largest number of votes. Nobody voted for any other office more than they had voted for her. She had gained the largest number of votes in the very first election in state history. Um, and that's saying something about how popular she was. The one time that she said she was a suffragist was in 1909 when she traveled to New York. And she said, I am now a suffragist, but only because I am here. New York needed the right to vote for women, but not Oklahoma.
She said, in Oklahoma, women don't need the right to vote. In New York, they do. So for her, it depended on where you were and the situation where women lived. Um, when you talk about her political career, there is one quote that I wanted um, to mention that she, that she made. She said, I know that a great many women of the state think that I ought to drop my work and take sides with them in, thus, in this struggle for suffrage, but I do not think I am capable of assuming any more load than I am now carrying. I'm already doing enough. <laughs> so she's fighting for women, she's fighting for children, she's fighting for workers, and she actually was. And what ends her career ultimately was the fact that she would put her career on the line for uh, the orphans of indigenous people. Um, and that was primarily because she was stepping outside of her bounds as a white woman and challenging both economic and racial norms. Uh, that's ultimately what would end her career. Um, what's, interestingly, what's interesting to me about Kate Barnard is that her activism was entirely on her terms, which I think is the theme of this book, is that each and every one of these women define their activism as they want. And that I think is, is the great strength of this book. And I look forward to all of your questions um, at the end of our session. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Sunu. I uh, am inspired to hear, um, to hear more about your work. I'm inspired uh, by Kate Barnard and her, uh, and her um, story as I am with uh, Lila uh, Lindsay as well. So again, we welcome your questions after we hear from our third speaker, Dr. Melissa N. Stuckey. Melissa Stuckey is Assistant Professor of African American History at Elizabeth City State University in Northeastern North Carolina. Author of Bully, Indian Territory, Exercising Freedom, in the All Black Town, published in the Journal of African American History in 2017, Stuckey is currently completing her first book entitled All Men Up, Race, Rights, and Power in the All Black Town of Bowley, Oklahoma, 1903 to 1939, which unveils the Black freedom struggle in Oklahoma as it took shape in the state's more than two dozen All Black towns. Melissa Stuckey also serves as Senior Historical Consultant to the, whole, the Coltrane Group, a nonprofit organization in Oklahoma committed to helping these towns survive in the 21st century. Melissa. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to thank uh, Patty and Sarah so very much for uh, including me in this amazing volume and for their real support uh, in, in helping me to see it through to the end uh, with all of the attendant duties that come with professing. So I really do appreciate your support uh, and I'm really, really proud of the entirety of this volume. And I'm delighted to be coming at, after Rowan and Sunu um, because of the intersections between the work uh, that I did um, on California Taylor, who my book chapter is about, and their uh, two protagonists as well. So there's some real brilliance um, to be found here in terms of a conversation, and I'm very excited for that conversation after. I'm going to uh, share my screen and share some slides. So my intention with this uh, conversation or my addition to this conversation is to do a little bit of framing about the world that California Taylor uh, represents in the black town of Bowley, in addition to sharing a little bit about her. So California Taylor arrived in Bowley as a 36 year old woman uh, in June of 1904. She came with a group of men who included her father, her husband and several brothers. She was born and raised in Houston, Texas 
1868, uh, making her a child of former slaves and a child of reconstruction, that post-Civil War moment that really transformed the United States. She was educated in Houston's segregated public schools and went on to earn a teacher certificate at Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee. When she returned to Houston, she did teach for a few years, but it's during that early adulthood period that we start to see some of the actions that Taylor engaged in that really become emblematic of her life. She was restless uh, and very independent. So she soon left teaching and became a dressmaker. And that was her uh, profession, um, her vocation when she eventually left uh, Houston during the height of uh, black disfranchisement and segregation in Texas and the rest of the Southern states. So um, when the opportunity to come to Bully, to move to Bully presents itself, she leaves with her husband and brothers who are all working for the railroads, her father who was an entrepreneur and had acquired a cotton gin um, and who would also had been a political, active in the political scene during reconstruction in, in Houston. So she'd known the heights of freedom and she also knew very much the constrictions that happened uh, in the years after reconstruction in Texas and uh, made the choice because some of her siblings chose to stay in, uh, in Texas and others moved to other places, but made the choice to start over again in an all black town in Oklahoma, a place that presumably she'd never been to prior to moving. So situating those black towns or the black town of Bowley, uh, this is a map that was created, I think by the Oklahoma Tourism Bureau uh, a number of years ago. And uh, it locates Bowley uh, amongst several other black towns that were established in the Muscogee Creek Nation uh, during the territorial period um, in Oklahoma. And um, Bowley grew to be the largest of these black towns because it had a railroad. Um, so Taylor arrives along with her, her family members by railroad. And that was something that a few other black towns had, but certainly most did not. Um, Bullies conceptually is, is, um, is, is self sort of uh, actualized as an, as an idea under black nationalism and racial destiny. Uh, in those cases, we're talking really lowercase black nationalism and racial destiny. Uh, which define African-American people as recognizing themselves as having a shared past in common or collective future. And that is really how a, the idea of a Black town as a place where people can forge a future together comes to be during this Jim Crow era. Um, and then racial destiny, um, you can almost see the outlines of, of my forthcoming book within the, the, uh, these concepts, right? Intraracial reform and political participation and interracial reform, meaning how they're defining themselves and creating or recreating meaning in black womanhood, black manhood, their future generations, and then also um, participating, very self-consciously participating in what they would have called a civilizing mission. Uh, some African-Americans went to Africa with the idea of Christianizing and quote unquote civilizing uh, natives there, African people there, uh, African-Americans who moved to Black towns um, often uh, espouse themselves as being the right people to, quote, civilize Native Americans there. So, um, I, you know, there are, they were people of their times for sure. So these are not unproblematic ideas, but they are ways that they were able to uh, invest themselves or, or try to make themselves integral to the American project. Um, by participating in what they would have called a, a civilizing mission. And then the other uh, big uh, act is uh, political participation. So beliefs that Oklahoma could become an all black state should uh, enough African-American people move there. And should that not happen at the very least that they could control portions of the state, portions or, or whole counties. Um, to that, uh, in addition to Bowley, there were two other all black towns in the county that Bowley was eventually situated in. And um, they did have the balance of power uh, within that state as members of the Republican party. 
uh, or within that county as members of the Republican Party. And it's for those reasons, uh, the kind of power that African-Americans in specific places uh, like the county that Bully situated uh, were uh, amassing so much political power or had the potential to amass so much political power for the Republican Party that the Democratic majority in, uh, uh, in Oklahoma uh, installed segregation and in the state constitution and then very quickly um, passed a grandfather clause voting amendment as one of the first uh, laws of the state. So, um, so that you know, sort of say that there were challenges, right? But within Boley itself, uh, they are theorizing themselves on uh, the idea of racial destiny and what it is that Boley can do. And what's important to me is really, as I'm thinking about black womanhood and black manhood in Boley, uh, is that I'm, you know, trying to kind of parse out the language and where it is that women fit. And quite, you know, if I'm honest, I'm looking at this quote by one of Bowie's founders, and it's very clear to me that the the gender dynamics are heavily male, right? The the, the public conversation uh, is is uh, you know strongly male, right? Um, and so the practice of black manhood as it functions um, as part of racial destiny really does dominate. The Bowley landscape. Uh, the founders of Bowley are considered to be men. People like James Barnett, who was a Creek freedman, uh, descendant of uh, a woman who was enslaved by the Creek Nation and amassed, along with his children, many, many acres of land on what would become Bowley, as well as uh, Bowley's early male leadership. And in here we see their town council. Um, but what is what I've been able to unpack um, as I worked on California Taylor and thinking about the rest of the women of Boley uh, is obviously there are women involved, right? We know that, but what is their imprint? How are they impacting things? And one of the, the biggest gems that I ever found, this is not California Taylor, another woman. Um, this is uh, a woman named Abigail Barnett, who was actually uh, James Barnett's daughter. And it's on her land that Boley was established, right? So this Boley is her land, right? Um, and this, I, I think, kind of thinking about Barnett as more than just a, a, a figure or you know piece on the puzzle that was moved uh, for for Bully to be established. She was a woman of Bully. She married within the town and was a leader in her on her own right. As was a woman like California Taylor, who came with the you know who the man who would become one of the biggest landowners and. Uh, business owners, her father with the cotton gin, and very prominent brothers. Uh, Abigail Barnett, similarly, is someone who could be in the shadows if we don't push further into the sources to find her story, right? Uh, so Black womanhood, uh, what does that mean in terms of racial destiny, and how are bully women participating in it? Um, Early 20th century black womanhood is conceptualized as being sexually virtuous. Uh, so really things that are about changing the narrative of what black women were considered to be during slavery. So sexually virtuous, domestically oriented, they're in the homes, they have healthy and well-run households. Um, if they are employed outside of the home, that employment is respectable and they're community oriented. Uh, and then I'm asking the question with Taylor and with these other women, how do bully women participate in these ideas? And I was able to really make the case, I think with Taylor in particular, that they did engage in that framework, but they also challenged its boundaries. And that really goes back to that quote from Thomas Haynes, one of Bully's founders, that you know others uh, came up with these ideas and theories. He's thinking about luminaries like Du Bois um, and even folks like Booker T. Washington, uh, who arguably is, is, is amongst those who's providing the tools in terms of education. But it's only in Bully that the people of Bully uh, and other places like it can actually um, test out these ideas and make them real and manifest them. Uh, so how does Taylor engage in that? How do other black women in Bowley engage in that? Well, you see before you two fantastic images. One of them is in the book, uh, this image that I think is California Taylor. And this other that is not in the book, uh, it's um, an expansion of an image that is in the book, uh, an advertisement in the newspaper that shows her uh, Taylor's work as a notary public, 
uh, and, and in this expansion, you actually see a couple of things. The most important for our purposes is the drugstore advertisement right next to it. But you can even see in the, uh, the, um, the advertisement beneath uh, Taylor's Notary Public, an advertisement for another woman, a bully who owned a millinery, a hat shop. So, um, you know, even in this piece, which unintentionally you can see that there, she's not alone in terms of her entrepreneurship and her active engagement with, with it, uh, in shaping the bully community. Um, so these images are important for a couple of reasons. One is that they do speak to the challenges of, of evidence that I have taken on in, in this entire subject, but certainly in, um, in, a, in working with California Taylor. Uh, for the later portion of her life, I've got a wonderful treasure trove of letters that she wrote while she was secretary of the Boley chapter of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People uh, when she was writing to the national office about the many, many woes that the Boley branch was experiencing in the 1930s, which is again, it's right after the Great Depression. Um, and if, if there's an economic uh, hit for the nation, it's going to hit Black America and literally a Black town so much harder than other places. They're so much more economically fragile. Uh, so we can learn lots about herself, her personality, and the woes and, and challenges that Bully's experiencing during this period through her, her correspondence with the NAACP. But the first half of her life, uh, some of the things that I shared with you uh, and others that, that I you know, have been really focused on, we don't know much, right? We're working with scraps of evidence and um, you know, I, I live in those scraps of evidence, right? Little pieces uh, of, of puzzles that allow me to trace her and find her at Fisk University in, as enrolled as a student in a, a, a uh, course, um, in, in the course catalog, the guide for, for, the, for the year. Um, little bits in the newspapers that let me know that she played piano while she was at Fisk and uh, continued that practice when she got back to Houston, that she participated in Freedmen's festivals, state festivals that were organized uh, to celebrate freedom, you know, similar to Juneteenth amongst African-Americans when she lived in Texas. Uh, it's all little tiny scraps here and there, uh, especially um, because this story I keep mentioning is, you know, how, how large her brothers, how large her father, and how large her husband's, especially her second husband, loomed in Boley. And yet she, unlike them, is someone who remains in Boley for about 30 years, right? So she gets there as a 36-year-old woman and, and remains there uh, for another 30 years or so until her death, whereas her father passes away very early. And then her husband as well um, is killed in the early 1930s. So she's got a longevity that many of the earlier bully settlers do not have. Some of them, including the founder, move, right? So the, found, the, the purported founder of bully, Thomas Haynes, who I've quoted, he moves out to California. Uh, but uh, and, uh, you know, there are others who pass away early. Uh, so there really is, are, is the strong backbone of women who sustain the town um, that, are, that, that re Taylor represents. Bully women, uh, op, you know, in addition to their, their vital farm and domestic labor, they operated businesses, they ran the post office, they taught in public and private schools in town and in rural areas around the town. Uh, as a notary public, California's fingerprints are literally all over an unknown number of documents related to tribal citizenship claims land ownership claims, property deeds, the list goes on. And in fact, in this book chapter, I make the case that Taylor is making her stake, her claim to citizenship through her work as a notary. Um, this was a position that was not, um, th that women did hold in various places uh, in the nation um, well before they could vote but it was a fraught and uncertain uh, standing that they had in this. Uh, states really did, uh, state legislators debated in many places whether or not women uh, were citizens, right? Could they even hold this position in which you had to be a citizen in order to be, uh, to hold the position? You're representing the government as a notary. 
Um, and it was not a question mark in Oklahoma. And I, I'm sure that many other women, in addition to Taylor, for that reason, really filled, you know, took on that role. It would have been a, a very likely role for someone who, who could go to secretary school by correspondence uh, or, you know, pick up the, the uh, you take the, the notary test and, and get their license. So she operated this public, uh, this notary office um, in a drugstore in town. This drugstore was the central hub of town. It was the place where people gathered. Uh, the owner, uh, David Turner, had a safe in the building. So before there was a bank, people would store their documents in the safe so that they would be safe. Um, eventually, um, Taylor, in addition to um, being a notary, would operate the first telephone, which was in the, the drugstore. So she'd be your telephone operator, connecting you to whomever it is that you needed to speak to on the other side. She used that position as well to relay news uh, in Boley to other places. And eventually she even um, takes correspondence classes to become a pharmacist and becomes a licensed pharmacist. And what's really significant about that to me is in addition to the fact that she did it, again, all of these multiple careers that she's taking on is that there are no women doctors in Boley. So her role as a dispenser of drugs in this drugstore, um, she really serves a particular or, or there's an opportunity for her to serve a particular role as someone who women could talk to, right, about medical concerns. And um, even if she wasn't the one prescribing the drugs, she could certainly be advising them. So here she is as a serving as a medical professional in a in, uh, slightly irregular way, just as she's serving as a government official in a slightly irregular way through these works as notary public and as pharmacist in this drugstore. Um, and then in terms of irregularities and these challenging of boundaries, Taylor will continue to do that. She does come to Bowley with a husband, but they do not stay together. They break up. Uh, he is even accused of stealing money from her and eventually leaves the town. The town turns their back on him. He tries to, he breaks, he was in business with their father. That business, that business partnership is dissolved. He tries to establish himself on his own in town and it doesn't work out. He goes back to Houston, she remains and um, is really protected in that divorce by that community that she was in. She boards uh, in the home of a, of a reverend and a first lady of the Baptist church. Um, on the census uh, for the year after the divorce, you'll see her listed as a widow. Not only was she not a widow, but everybody in town certainly knew she wasn't a widow. The census taker was someone from the town. That person knew that she was not a widow, uh, but there is a way to protect her rather than having divorce being recorded on official government documents that are going who knows where and looked at by who knows who. Um, similarly, she takes on her maiden name, her, her uh, born name of Miss California Taylor, erasing all aspects of Mrs. C.M. Brock, which is what you see there as the notary. Uh, but she charts her own course and continues to do so, working so closely uh, with uh, David Turner of the drugstore that they do seem to have engaged in, in a romantic affair while he was married. Uh, she's named in the divorce papers that David Turner's wife files, but uh, it appears that the divorce does not happen uh, and that the, those two remain married until uh, the first Mrs. Turner's death. Uh, in the 1920s, um, during which period California leaves Bowley for a brief amount of time and travels the world, uh, finally settling uh, in, in Kansas, where she may have thought she would live out her days. But the passion burned deep between she and David Turner, and they were married. He went and, and found her in, in Kansas, married her, and they returned to Bowley, which is where she began that second life as an established kind of bully matron as we see the woman who I believe to be her in this image. Uh, she you know, returns to her church work, her activism, and takes on this important role as secretary of the NAACP. Uh, so I'm going to leave it there, but it's this incredibly colorful life of, of uh, one of Bully's um, 
leaders, but one that we would not hear about, you know, just by kind of not challenging the sources and squeezing them to, uh, to, till they run dry to get these kinds of stories that help us to better understand the roles that women like Taylor played in shaping the town, in sustaining the town, and in maintaining the town. And frankly, also in keeping the town's memory. One of the nice things about doing this kind of work is sort of the meta feel that you get when you're looking at a, um, a master's thesis written by a, a, a woman of Boley in the 1950s who interviewed Taylor within her own master's thesis. So I do, of, of the few quotes that I have about Taylor are her talking about the history of Boley uh, to a younger woman who was also from the town who was now going on to get a master's degree. So there are these, um, these kind of inheritances uh, that keep, keep on uh, in, in maintaining these stories. And that's one of them. Thank you very much, uh, Melissa. Um, thank you everybody for your uh, wonderful presentations. This has just been fascinating and I really appreciate all of it. We now have time for questions. Um, if you could enter have into the Q&A box, which you'll see down at the bottom. Uh, we don't have any at the moment, but I thought, um, to start us off, I'd throw something to Patty and Sarah and, and just ask you, you know, from a larger overall standpoint, looking at the trajectory of women's activism in Oklahoma, are there any trends or um, overall patterns that you saw or, or things that surprised you? As, as you were looking um, at the larger picture uh, as you were editing this volume? So I, I think, Patty, I'll let you talk about maternalism since that ties so well with your chapter. But I think part of what we saw is that, you know, th there's often a challenge when you do biography, right? And a lot of historians shy away from it because they say you'll either come to hate the person you're writing about or you'll identify with them and you won't be analytical enough of them. And, and, and so, you know, I, I think what was interesting is to watch with each of the women covered in the book, it's not this kind of, and that's how we got to be great women today. It's This is not a book that is about great women. I mean, what you see for all of the three women that were discussed today, but also many of the others in the book is um, a, a bittersweet element to their life's work, right? That, that they don't all die feeling like they have accomplished these great things, that many of the challenges, there are temporary gains, right? There are these great moments of opportunity for women in Boley, for example, that, that were uncommon nationally. But as we see the 20th century progress, and we go from looking at Melissa's chapter to looking at the painful struggles that we see with Ada Lois Fisher and Clara Looper, we're reminded that these are not things that were static or that there's not a linear progression toward overcoming the obstacles and, and being able to write women into history. So I think that's one of the things that stood out. The last thing I wanna mention because you really see Melissa talking about it is the courage to delve into a project where you don't have a lot of sources, right? Some of these women wrote pluralifically, um, you know, and we have a lot of information about them and some of them we don't. And to be able to say, well, I wanna know as much as I can about this woman. And so sometimes I'm gonna just suggest some possibilities. Um, and, and I think that's a really important element of studying women's history, particularly indigenous women's activism and black women's activism, is to be able to kind of open it up in that way and, and take some risks with speculation. And then, of course, maternalism is a fascinating aspect of it. And Patty, you should speak to that. All right. All right. Well, I, I look forward to all the questions. So I really invite you to type your questions in the chat so we can see who's here and what you're thinking about after you've heard these three uh, phenomenal scholars talk about their work. Um, just thinking about uh, how the book came together and the topics, um, you see women's presence throughout Oklahoma history. 
and we'll just see it again and again. And we hope to see many more works like this where we're bringing together incredible women scholars engaging in this work and talking about Oklahoma history in new and compelling ways. So in this case, when we're thinking about maternalism and using the politics of motherhood um, for advocacy and for gain, we look at um, Amy Scott's work early in the book on Alice Robertson, and it's kind of book ended with my uh, work on Mary Fallon. Uh, in the latter part of the book, talking about the politics of motherhood in her campaigns. Um, and so you see throughout all of these stories, the resilience of uh, women's political moments and advocacy and their challenges. Um, and in the case of Mary Fallon, how she's using uh, her children uh, on the campaign trail and motherhood and even talking about the topic of abortion um, as she's being cultivated by the Republican Party. All of these different challenges come to bear and I'll just leave you with this when I think about Mary Fallon. She, she says, and this is in, a, in oral history in Mary Larson's co collection, so I, I really need to say thank you for, for that work. She says, um, you wonder how, how tough women are um, you try to have you try to have a a a baby uh, between uh, between elections and then tell and then you, then ask me again how tough I, I am. She was campaigning eight months pregnant. She was very tough. Um, so you see um, the toughness come to bear, uh, and at the same time, she never lost an election. So um, questions, questions from you all. We do have a few questions in the Q&A here. Uh, the first is from Joy Tucker, who uh, thanks everyone for the presentations, and was wondering if Clara Looper or Representative Pittman are, are mentioned in the book. So yes, Clara Looper has a chapter. So in the, the same section from Melissa's chapter appears. Melissa's is first, and then there is a piece on Ada Lois Sipiel Fisher, and then Clara Looper, and then the final chapter in that section is one that I did on a white woman who was put in an insane asylum for five years for trying to sell her house to a black man. So we kind of have a range of ways of looking at activism in the context of civil rights and the, the sort of notion of the, the politics of gender. Okay, the next question is from Kathleen Kelly, um, who congratulated everyone on great presentations and uh, on fascinating historical actors and activists. Uh, her question is for Sunu. Could you tell us a little more about your book length project on anti-suffragists in the American West? Who are some of these other protagonists and how did they frame their anti-suffragism? So, um, in talking about anti-suffragists in the American West, really what I focus on is how anti-suffragists in the East respond to the success of suffrage in the West. Um, because uh, women's suffrage it takes place uh, in the West first. And so um, what happens is anti-suffrage uh, movements, um, state, uh, state anti-suffrage organizations in the East sort of respond uh, and react to the success of suffrage in the West and um, make all sorts of accusations to it. And as uh, suffrage succeeds in the West and grows and spreads in the West, anti-suffrage grows in the East. Um, and it's not until 1911 when California finally gets suffrage that you have a national anti-suffrage organization. Um, and so that's, there's sort of a back and forth between the coasts. Um, and I take a look at Alice Robertson, who is covered uh, in the book. Um, Alice Robertson um, sort of becomes the sort of culmination point uh, because she is an anti-suffragist in Oklahoma. She campaigns against suffrage. And then after Oklahoma passes equal suffrage in 1918, she decides she's going to run for office naturally um, and becomes uh, uh, our first congresswoman uh, from Oklahoma. So 
it there's a, a switch right of um and she suddenly goes from being an anti-suffragist to politically active and so you have to ask yourself okay why is it okay to for women to not be politically active to suddenly now run for political office and again it goes to that theme that that we talked about earlier about how women as individuals are defining that political activism for themselves great question thank you um, our next question is from Michelle Martin. This is for Rowan. Um, she asks if you've found any connections between Lila Denton Lindsay and Sophia Alice Callahan. She says both women were Muskogee and active in various educational and social endeavors. Also in looking at the youth and states program of the Muskogee Nation, did you see any connections between the Muskogee Nation and Howard University as a place where students were sent for training? Oh, thank you. Those are great questions. So um, I'm just thinking through like the, the broader circle of acquaintances. And I, I mean, I, I would assume that because they were contemporaries, uh, Lila Lindsay probably was acquainted with Callahan. I'd have to go back, you know, through her correspondence and the records um, to know for sure, but certainly um, some overlapping interests and involvement there. Uh, as far as Howard goes, um, I don't recall right offhand any students attending. Um, I don't want to say a flat out no, um, just because I haven't found complete records for all of those students. I know several went to um, uh, what's now the College of Worcester. Uh, I didn't mention Lila Lindsay herself actually first went to what's now uh, William Woods University in Fulton, Missouri for a year before transferring to Highland Institute. But what I did find is that several of the placements, it seemed like um, were being kind of facilitated through uh, missionary connections. So missionaries like the Robertson family and others who'd been serving in the Muscogee Creek Nation um, were kind of calling on their contacts as well to help place these students in the various uh, colleges in the U.S. Okay, we have another question uh, from Michelle Martin uh, for all of the panelists. What role do you think print capitalism played in helping to make or break the careers of the women featured in your work? Uh, do you think they were able to control their own images successfully and use their femininity to their advantage or did their gender work against them? Melissa, I think you should take this because I think California had more jobs um, than any of the women that we've talked about. Yeah, and her work uh, was in uh, journalism for to some extent, right? So um, you know, it's it's an interesting uh, sword, the you know the paper, right, and the pen, um, and black women were maligned in mainstream news media right just simply maligned their uh, when we look at those ideas about black womanhood and what it was that black women were trying to establish that they were uh nationally it was virtuous because they were being portrayed as you know unvirtuous as terrible mothers as uh, drains on society uh, as uneducated. So they did everything in their power, including to use their own press, to use the African American press as uh, ways to articulate themselves and to, to define themselves differently. So Ida B. Wells obviously comes to mind as, uh, as the vanguard of that in terms of Black women's journalism. So California Taylor and the work that she did, you know, certainly was working in those, in, in that direction um, by taking advantage of the Black Press to even in her simple role as local reporter to talk about the particular kinds of events that Black women were hosting in their town, their comings and goings in terms of going to school, uh, their work, et cetera. So just by, you know, she didn't use her pen to, to write many editorials. There are a few editorialized comments, however, in her columns towards the end of her life, where she challenges disfranchisement as something uh, and segregation as things that are really going to destroy the nation uh, in the midst of World War One, right? So she does 
take advantage of moments like that where she has opportunities. But for the most part, it really is by doing the work for the town or of the town and representing uh, the town to the world. So rather than explicit commentary, but nonetheless, um, the it's almost like the accumulation of evidence is what we use to prove the case. The fact that there are so many women's organizations that can represent themselves in their in their town's newspaper uh, and that there are so many women who can advertise their own business in their town's newspaper, that there are so many people who can support the school teachers with women's organizations that uh, do exactly that by providing resources for the schools. Uh, so it's by the doing again, you know, as, as Thomas Haynes wrote uh, in that in that early uh, Bully Progress article. Did anybody else want to touch on that one? Well, just a kind of quick comment about all of the, the women that we're talking about in the book. There's always a kind of interesting relationship between the way that women are depicted in different time periods. And the women that we've talked about today, during this period where you really do see the fluidity of opportunity, you, you do see women better able to control the image of self, right? And, and that's going to change and break down over time um, so that you, you begin to see challenges of women just kind of being erased, um, written out. We certainly are going to see ongoing challenges with the reassertion of tribal sovereignty by indigenous activists who are deeply engaged in the economic implications for their nations um, and, and often continuing to fight the way that indigenous people are characterized in the media. So like LaDonna Harris, who's in the last section of the book, struggles with that and, and trying to address some of these ways of negatively portraying indigenous people. And, and so it's a, it's a theme I think that you see emerging throughout the book. Okay, well, did anyone want to make any closing comments? We're getting towards the end of our time. Um, so if any of you, Patty, Sarah, if you wanted to do a wrap up or if anyone else had any closing comments that they wanted to add in, um, I think now would be a great time to give you a chance to do that. Could we just ask the three presenters, because you didn't get a chance to kind of end with what happens to these women at the end. And so if you wanted to each take a couple of minutes to talk about what happens to them by the end of their lives. Rowan, would you like to go first? Yeah, sure. So, um, and this kind of builds a little bit on the previous question as well. I will say that uh, Lila Lindsay, um, you know, she only taught about a decade or so, but throughout her life, she very much played up um, on her identity as a teacher. So there's this quote sort of throughout the records of her as Tulsa's first and most beloved teacher. Um, and she very much like emphasized that. And um, so, you know, staying uh, tied and connected with her former students was something she did, you know, well in uh, to her later years, but she was also very active. So I, I didn't talk about she uh, got into sort of historic preservation efforts. She was writing uh, her own histories and sort of histories of um, some of her, you know, some people in her network and uh, the schools in the region, even though they weren't published, she was very concerned with preserving that. Um, and she even, I found, um, was writing to John Collier when he was head of the Bureau of Indian Affairs and trying to push him and trying to push for reform at the federal level. And she asked him for a job if she could sort of oversee some uh, efforts in Oklahoma. And he uh, turned her down saying they weren't interested in, you know, hiring someone of her advanced age. But, um, you know, right up till the end, I would say she was very much still, um, you know, concerned and emphasizing her identity in this educator role, but then also um, concerned with preserving this history that she and others had helped shape throughout this period we've been 
discussing this afternoon. Um, so I touched upon this a little bit in my talk, but Kate Barnard, the moment she started to advocate for um, indigenous orphans and making sure that they were protected and, and uh, getting land that was rightfully theirs, um, this was during her second term in office, uh, the state legislature started to cut the budget for her office uh, significantly. And so after a while, she was uh, unable to actually get anything done uh, from her office and uh, in her position. And uh, by the end of her life, she was incredibly ill. She could not uh, physically do anything either. And by the time um, she died, which was um, in 1930, uh, she had died alone. Um, she really had no family to support her or, and she had friends around her, but it was, it was a very lonely life for her. Um, but she had remained true to her activist life. And so she did not compromise in what she believed. Um, and so uh, she very much, um, while she uh, was sad and depressed um, towards the end, she was she did not regret her choices on staying true to her ideals. And so she did not regret that. So Taylor lives until her 80s. Uh, she retires uh, from her NAACP work uh, with uh, a note saying, I've done what I could in terms of trying to get a moribund bully NAACP moving. Um, she does get cancer at some point and moves back to Texas and lives with her brother, one of her brothers, and that's where she passes away um, at the age of about 88. Well, thank you all. I, I cannot say enough how much we appreciate um, having you here today to talk about the book. I think everybody should run out to your nearest independent bookseller and go buy a copy or uh, get one at your local library. Um, I was going to say my copy's right here someplace. I've, it's just out of arm's reach. But um, yeah, get one at your library, get one at your local bookseller, um, ask, ask your library to carry it. Um, that's always a good thing. Thank you again so very much for being here today, uh, for joining us for this talk. And um, I hope everybody has a good rest of your week and a good semester. Thank you again.